Now we're starting uh, chapter 11, and this is on, on biodiversity and evolution of organisms. So we've got the players and, and we, we're um, gonna, gonna put them in action. And the uh, image on the left, as I mentioned earlier, is Sekio dutia uh, tridentata. It's a blind, um, a blind amp, uh, isopod that's found in uh, karst aquifers in the Kansas region. And then there's a little green hair and this one happens to be, picture happens to be from the Pantanal in the wetland of Brazil, but you can see them in Kansas as well, if you're lucky. So they're just some, some of my favorite species, uh, a lot of favorite species. I'm biophilic. Okay, so in this chapter, we're gonna talk about measures of diversity, how, how we measure diversity, temporal and spatial factors that influence evolution of freshwater organisms short-term and local distribution factors on, on species, invasion, species invasions, non-native species, extinction, and talk a little bit about the value of freshwater species diversity. So the first topic is measures of diversity, and the most straightforward is just the species richness. How many species are there? So when people do you know, bird counts, they just count how many species they're, they're there, and they keep lists and such. And, and that's the easiest, uh, most straightforward one. But um, it does not necessarily really represent the full richness of diversity because evenness, how well represented each species is, is important as well. So you can imagine that if you have two systems with 10 species and each species had one or two, except for one that had a thousand right, uh, individuals, and you compare that to um, the 10 species, each one had 100 individuals, the second would be more even, right? That, that your chance of hitting the same species if you sampled one and you sampled the next one is, is lower the more even, when it's more even. If it's not, if the evenness is low, if it's mostly dominated by one species, your chance of getting the same species again is, is, is higher if you randomly sample that population. And we use a Shannon Weiner. Sometimes it's called Shannon Weaver, um, if this, which isn't quite correct, or Shannon Diversity of Index that combines both of those. And the equation for this um, just sums the proportion versus the um, versus the maximum proportion that could be over all the species. Um, and then we can talk about whether we're we're talking within habitat alpha diversity and beta diversity. So why are evenness and species richness both important components of diversity? So we've got a lot of good answers here um, that they're both important components of diversity. Um, if you just try to manage for, for uh, species richness, you may have so few species that, of one type that it, it just won't stay in the system, for example. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act is based on, on, on preserving specific species. So it's mostly talking about richness. And that's part of the battle is, is there a minimum number of species that you can have there that survive? And we'll, we'll talk about that as, as well. So both the components are important. Certainly if you're talking about biodiversity and ecosystem structure, the evenness is, 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 is really, um, if you think richer communities, have more of an effect on ecosystem function, then obviously a an, an low evenness is not gonna have, have as much diversity in there. Um, yeah, so diversity influences ecosystem structure. You can think of things like the aquatic insects that we just talked about, where there's some that eat leaves, shredders, there's some that graze, there's some that are predators, there's some that collect particles. And if you only have a few of one of those, then like all the leaves build up if you don't have any shredders. So you can imagine that being um, a reason that even this might be important. Alpha and beta diversity, so within habitat and between habitat diversity. So if we look at these two groups of ponds, um, and A, B, C, and D, and E, F, G, right, um, which one, which of these groups of ponds has greater between habitat diversity? Uh, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, B, I don't know, B isn't the, the second one, right? So the between habitat diversity, I think Cassidy answered that the, this series of ponds, G to F, had greater between habitat diversity. Um, well, and Jaden, Jaden seconded that, and I'm sorry to report that you are incorrect. Um, there's, if, if you go to this habitat, then you go to the next habitat, right? You're likely to see a bunch of fish here. You might, you just see a fish, but you're more likely to see a frog in this habitat, you're more likely to see a, a, a turtle in this habitat, more likely to see a snail in this habitat. So between habitat diversity is high here, within habitat diversity is low because it's almost all fishes here, almost all frogs there. In this case, you're just about as likely to catch and get any species between habitats, but within each habitat, diversity is higher. Okay, so you can see what, how alpha and, and beta diversity play off against each other, depending upon the distribution of where the species are. And this could be really important if you're, if you're trying to uh, manage biodiversity, for example. Um, if you're targeting, uh, pr protecting this, this fish, in this type of situation, you'd say, okay, what is it about this pond that's making it so this fish is here? Is it because it can only get here? Is it because the physical habitat is better, the chemical care conditions? In this case, you'd say, oh, I'm gonna protect, I wanna pr protect this fish. Well, maybe I should be protecting all these ponds because they're all good habitat for it. And, and we need to, you know, something's going right, at least to keep them hanging in there. So is the A referring to the left half of the slide and B referring to the right half of the slide? What do you mean? So it's labeled, I didn't pre-read this chapter. Um, so oh. the A and B diversity. Oh, alpha. I'm not, yeah, alpha and beta, yeah. So the left side, the A through D is alpha and then E through so, yeah, alpha is within habitat and beta is between habitat diversity. So within habitat diversity is higher in this group of ponds. Alpha diversity is higher here. Beta diversity between habitat diversity is greater in this group of ponds. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I, maybe I should have these, just for clarity, I should have these numbered, uh, ponds numbered rather than than lettered because there's an A and then there's the Greek alpha, which might be a little bit confusing there. It would confuse me when you ask the question. <clears throat> so that's actually a suggestion. If somebody sends it to me, maybe they'll end up getting points. Okay. You want to talk about temporal and spatial factors that influence evolution of freshwater organisms. So now we talked about how you you think about diversity. Now we'll think, we'll talk about what creates diversity. And one of the things is that time. Um, ancient lakes and watersheds have many unique species and high diversity. So example, Lake Baikal, millions of years old, has 377 en endemic crustacea, 86 endemic, mean, endemic meaning only found in that lake, right? Those species are unique to that lake. 86 turbolarians, <clears throat> 98 unique mollusks, 29 fish and a freshwater seal that somehow got up there, uh, you know, swam up from the ocean at some point and and is, is uh, then stranded in that lake, essentially. It only lives in that lake. So, so why is it that these old habitats um, have so much biodiversity? In contrast to glacial lakes in, in, in north, the northern part of the United States and Canada have relatively low diversity um, because they were they were glaciated and um, they, they, they don't have as high diversity. They've been in existence for maybe 10,000 years as opposed to millions of years. Is it? Yeah, I see in the, that Lane said in the chat. Right. Um, exactly. They've been undisturbed for longer. Yeah, evolution can take time. And the longer, longer the length of time, the higher the diversity. And you can think of that in the really largest scale. The diversity on Earth has increased over the evolution of life um, although now we're in a, we're in a time period where extinction rates are extraordinarily high and diversity is decreasing uh, because of human act activities um, geographic isolation is also important um, so if you remember back to your to your uh, 
earlier biology classes, you can if if organisms are unable to reproduce with each other, then genetic drift can just cause them to to separate and not be being able to reproduce again, or the different selective pressures in the different areas can cause one species to go one way and the other species to go another way to the point where they're, well, one population to go one way and one population to go the other way until the point where they're different species. Um, so we have examples of that unique groundwater fauna. We've already talked about that related to isolation. Um, just, and so they'll be related to the species that are found in the, tre uh, in the surface um, and the fresh waters and, and the lighted, but they, they tend to have different adaptations. <clears throat> And the dispersal ability can be linked to the degree of isolation. So things that are really lousy dispersers um, may evolve more, more unique um, populations than those that are dispersed easily. So an aquatic insect has an adult that flies a long distance, may be everywhere, ubiquitous, right? And may not have many unique new, new species, but a fish that can't swim from one watershed to the other um, if they're separated from each other then might, might um, evolve. Temporary pools can have many endemic species because they're isolated from each other repeatedly and um, they also require unique adaptations to which we'll also talk about. Um, I can't stop thinking about the seal in Lake Baikal. You'd have to have multiple ones get up there at the same time, right? So maybe like one event that sent them there and they had to stay. Yeah, you'd have to have you'd have to have a min minimum viable population. So you'd have to have more than just probably more than just a pair, like a sexually um, reproductive pair. You'd and then maybe, have. okay. And then maybe this is too complicated to answer here, and maybe off topic. But do they have the same problems with like too much interbreeding within the same few individuals that like it causes problems? Like if a brother seal and a sister seal, is that a bad idea? Yes, that's the same idea as minimum viable populations that we'll, we'll talk about in, when we talk about conservation, that okay. you don't want to have too closely related species. So go through a bottleneck and then oftentimes that will cause problems, um, you know, just like breeding dogs too closely to each other and breeding dogs or, you know, people stuck on islands or something like that. It's, it's, it's a common thing. So it's a good question. Okay. Um, so here's some of the, some of the different like really large lakes. Um, we talked about um, Lake Baikal, and that's the first one. And we see that one uh, has mostly dominated by endemic crustaceans. Not so many fishes, but I mean, some, but not so many. And, you know, almost 900 unique endemic, uh, endemic species. And they, but they do have some cosmopolitan species in here, right? So, there's about equal numbers of endemic and cosmopolitan. That means everywhere else, um, fishes. Um, and they have um, way more endemic than cosmopolitan mollusks and way more endemic of crustaceans than, than cosmopolitan. Tanganyika is in the Rift Valley in Malawi and Victoria are in Africa. The Rift Valley, all relatively ancient complexes of lakes that have been variously connected over time. In these lakes, uh, oh, Lane, did I answer your question? What's cosmopolitan? Found everywhere. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry. found everywhere. No, that's all right. I, you, need, you need to ask questions. I, I like this. Um, people are actually more likely to ask questions in, in this format than they are in a person-to-person -person class for some reason. They're, they're more, more open to chatting um, online um, and not... not afraid of being wrong or something like that. So I, I, I really appreciate any questions that I get, whether interrupt me verbally or chat, whichever you want. Um, yeah, so for some reason, the fish has just exploded in, in Africa, whereas the, um, the crustaceans exploded in, in uh, Baikal. And in contrast, the Great Lakes actually have a surface area that's about as, as um, total surface area that's about as big as by color of these, these lakes together, but almost all cosmopolitan species. And the reason for that is that the, they were under the, the ice sheet when, you know, repeatedly over the glaciations. And so each time they were under an ice sheet, everything pretty much goes away. Maybe some things, 
can survive under there, but um, then it has to come in from outside. So if it has to come in from outside, your chance of having a cosmopolitan species is, is much greater. <clears throat> So this is just a image of, of Lake Baikal. And they know how old it is because they can core the sediment down here. This is a cross section. And they there it's been around for um, between up to 35 million years. And this is a fault lake. So the fault is the faults are slipping down. And the lake surface now, even though it's an extraordinarily deep lake, it's two kilometers deep, right? Um, it there's um, there's more than that, there's another four kilometers of sediment that's been laid down over that 35 million years. And they can drill and use isotopes to get at the age, the age of the lake. And these are some of the amphipods that are found in Lake Baikal. Um, just to give you an idea of the diversity of shapes, remember these are the crustaceans and they're, they are laterally compressed. Um, so that's why they're lying on their side. And they presumably have quite different um, things that they feed on. They could maybe be predators or feeding on, on detritus or grazers, depending upon wh what they specialize in. You're saying they're really, they literally are always on their side. This isn't just a side view. They literally lay on their sides. No, no, no. They're, they're just, their body is physically flat that way. They, they'll actually be upright like this and either swimming in the water or crawling along the bottom. Uh, like but they're kind of 2D, like a flea. Yeah, yeah, they, their body shape is like a flea. That's true. Okay. But, you know, just like fle fleas don't just fly around on their side all the time. They have to uh, crawl <laughs> dog fur yeah. and cat fur. All right. And so here are um, some, of the, some of the fishes in, from Tanganyika. Um, and you can see that they're actually fairly related. The cichlids are, are you know, not, not a, they're an incredibly diverse group but they just have all kinds of different morphologies that they've adapted. So these guys are, are um, eat scales off of other fishes and some of them graze off of rocks. So they have this downturned mouth perhaps. And, and you can see the different mouth shapes are adapted to, to what, what they do. Um, and then because they've actually probably diverged partially from sexual selection um, that you can see the incredibly different numbers of types of of looks of these, both body shape and coloration, even though these are relatively closely related um, um, genera, they, they, they have an incredible diversity that, that's adapted. What do you think that forehead is for on Cyphotilopia? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know mm -hmm. the species that well, so um, it would be a Google a Google question or, you know, Google Scholar question, maybe. Um, okay. Some of these are, are somewhat endangered now because they're uh, value, valued aquarium fishes and, and uh, people collect them in the wild, which is, you know, not necessarily a good thing. Um, there's something about this group of species that they're just um, set up for explosive speciation. So not only are there are a lot of species here, but um, there's there's lakes in South America that, that also have uh, cichlids in them that are quite diverse and, and in different lakes fairly near to each other they're, they're still um, they've evolved different different species so there appear to be some groups that that are prone to um, adaptive uh, uh, radiation so we're talking about the long term um, but also when when you're out in the environment. Um, there's a lot of short-term factors influencing local dis distribution of species. And we talked about colonization already. Habitat type, you know, if, you, if you're an angler, um, you know where the fishes like to be, right? They're in, and the type of habitat that, that would encourage them. So in the Kansas River, for example, this mostly sandy bottom, log jams are a big one, or, or where it hits rocky banks, where there's structure, um, where there's cover. Those might be the kinds of things. In addition, disturbance can be quite important. We'll talk about the succession and disturbance. Um, and we already talked in the hydrology um, of streams, we talked about that Slaty River in New Zealand that floods intensively almost every week. And really the diversity is incredibly low because there nothing can hang in there. Um, 
productivity if a system is super, super low productive, um, diversity it will be low. If it's intermediate, it'll be high. If it's super productive and you know, super eutrophic lakes are not that diverse, and it's just because the oxygen drops out at night and there's toxic algae in there and, and not much can be, uh, is adapted to that. Species interactions and species introductions are also important. So we can think of habitat as template for evolution. And this is an example of some of the habitats and some of the words we've used and some of them are new. <clears throat> and the benthos, the benthic zone, um, the benthic zone, so the benthos are the organisms that live in the benthic zone. And in the littoral zone, that, that is this area, the shallow area where the, where the light can hit the bottom, we might have hydra, we saw those, bryozoans, leeches, ostracods or ostracodes, midges, um, and amphipods. Um, in the deep waters, the profundal benthic zone, the benthos or the organisms there, the gastrochicks, those microscopic little hairy things that we saw, flatworms, um, nematodes, oligochetes, and, and midges. So the, the, um, the worms and the midges and the nematodes might be common there. In the water column in the shallow areas, we might have water mites, rotifers, cladocera, water boatmen, um, uh, phantom midges can come up there. In pelagic, open water, we have, um, we have um, pelagic zooplankton and new stun. What's the time? I'm sorry, I lost the time. It's 11.17. Okay, we're getting close. Um, so Neuston is the surface uh, of the water, a unique habitat where you have you know, water striders, water mites, springtails, and we'll talk about that again as, as, a, um, as, a, as a unique habitat. And I am going to stop here. Can you go back one for just a second? Sure, let me stop recording. And then...